So this is an interesting news story. Uh, this is from ABC News, and it's titled, Service Dogs Provide a Lifeline for People with Disabilities. Obtaining a dog could be hard with costs ranging between fifteen dollars and $50,000, which is very true. Um, the majority of that cost, t especially for um, nonprofits, also go goes towards training other service dogs, especially when you get into like the 50K, 30 to 50K range. It pays for staffing, it pays for feeding the dogs, housing the dogs, right? All of those things combined to make that amount. Uh, this article is by Emily Schutz and it was published on August 10th of 22. So they go into talking about Robert Gaylog. He has a service dog named Callie that was trained by an organization. Um, it's crucial for him to have this dog in order to navigate public spaces and maintain his health. He suffered a traumatic brain injury, or otherwise known as TBI, and needed someone to help him after his wife died. And that's when he was able to find someone to help him and provide him with a mobility dog that was actually free of charge. And he said that that moment changed his life. He goes on to say, we're a good fit because Callie is a great navigator. I have trouble with steps. I do have a cane that I use, and most of the times when I fall, it's because I don't have my cane, but when I take Callie out, I do not need a cane. Now, the rescue lab mix leads him through the grocery store or supports him when he steps over a curb. She's also allowed him to engage with the world in a way that he hasn't been able to do in quite some time. A few months ago, the pair attended the funeral of a veteran and Callie noticed family and friends walking to the casket to say their goodbyes. That's when she stood up and led Gaylog so that he could do the same. He recalled the moment tearfully, saying that this was when he put all of his trust in her. He wasn't always certain he wanted a service dog. Having Callie around meant giving up any ability to exist in public spaces without being looked at or sometimes even being denied services, which, I mean, that's a pretty big problem in the world. The sheer lack of education that staff have, whether it, you're going to Walmart, whether you're going to a restaurant, whether you're going to anywhere, even a place of work, um, I believe this article elaborates on it more. So we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit more detail. That's what happened to Candace Camper when she tried to enter a restaurant with her service dog, Clea, last year. Often the general public has misconceptions about service dog, what they do and what the law requires, Camper explained. The two questions that business owners are legally allowed to ask, which some people are scared to do, is number one, is this a service dog? And number two, if what, ta what tasks are, is the dog trained to perform? Which I really like this article. This is why I picked it, because it's actually accurate information. I can remember just two years ago, um, looking through all these articles about service dogs and they were swapping out service and therapy dog all the time or they even threw an ESA and those are all three completely different things so to see you know ABC News to actually get their facts like right and correct that's really nice typically I see those issues with more local stories um, smaller town newspapers so I'm just thankful that ABC was able to do their research um, and get it correct. Camper also says sometimes businesses ask for service dog identification cards, which is illegal under the ADA. That's also true. You can go to, uh, the ADA has, of course, their website. I believe it's ada.org. And they do have a frequently asked questions page just listed with all other FAQs. And this is one of the things that they address, is that service dogs do not need registration or identification cards. Uh, anybody asking for that, they don't know what they're talking about, basically. Um, there is, to my knowledge, one state 
that has it optional, and that is the state of California. California does have a state registry, and they can do that legally under the ADA, but they cannot require it, right? So just, <laughs> just for your awareness there. But dealing with an uncertain public isn't the only obstacle handlers face when their disability requires the assistance of a trained animal. Obtaining a service dog in itself can be a challenging task, which can be cost between fifteen and thirty thousand dollars. Luckily, there are nonprofits to support those who need them, such as retired veteran Seth Yur. She kind of picked me in 2019, so we do what's called a bump, where we run several dogs in front of the client to see which one fits best. Um, the nonprofit provided years of training to Yuri's psychiatric service, Golden Retriever, and again, psychiatric service dog, totally different than an emotional support animal, okay? And the dog's name is Harris. And all he had to do was try to fundraise. Oh, fun fundraising, by the way, is also a fantastic thing to do uh, when you don't have the money. Um, I recall uh, a friend, a friend of mine who actually got onto television, which is a great goal to have. And the remaining amount that they needed for the fundraiser for this dog was anonymously donated by mail with a check. So um, it's definitely possible. And you just have to get out there and see what you can do. There's many different ways you can fundraise for a service dog. Okay, where was I at last? Okay. And all he had to do was try to fundraise. Beyond that, the cost was covered. Now, your works for the nonprofit as their program manager of client training, teaching those in need how to work with a service dog. That's fantastic. I love that. Service dog handlers say that the pair is meant to work as a team and having the support of that team can change a life. One of the best feelings is being able to help the next person that's going through the process, Yur says. That is the end of the article. It's fairly short, but I really like it. Um, I mean, there's, there's so much more content that if you are first starting to learn about service dogs, you just ran across this content of mine, go check out my blog. Um, my website is caitlinsanimals.com. And you can also check out my YouTube channel, which has some more articles and more details about service dogs. Um, one of the services, I offer a variety of services. Um, my business is now starting to pivot towards specifically puppy raising and service dogs. And I do puppy raise for people. I also coach for people. Now, when it comes to starting your service dog journey, if you have not already gotten your dog, please wait to reach out to me or to get your dog assessed. Um, I am currently a very huge advocate of pushing a very specific test or evaluation called CARAT test, C-A-R-A-T, and that is by Suzanne Clothier. There are cur it is currently the only temperament test. It's really not a temperament test. It's more of a, it's a conversation. It's recorded. It's a conversation between the assessor and the dog saying, okay, who are you at your core as a dog? What is your personality like? What do you like to do? Where are you more avoidant? Where are you more activated? right? Do you like to sniff more or do you like to look at birds more? Okay. So it's really asking the dog, what is it that you like to do internally? What reinforces you internally, right? And there's a lot of different things um, that can apply this to. I kind of relate it back to the Myers-Briggs personality test for people. If you guys haven't heard of that, you can do a quick little Google search and do a Myers-Briggs uh, test for on yourself for free online. Uh, but it's a, it's a little more complex and in order to actually give the test, you need to go through two years of learning and training 
in order to become a certified carrot assessor. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's so few in the US. Last I checked, there's only seven or eight total certified carrot assessors in the US. It does take time, it does take money, it does take skill, and um, in order to just be able to give the test, right? Because if you go to other kind of temperament tests, or, or the ones that people truly call temperament tests, uh, I believe, what's the most common one? Um, why am I picturing blue, the color blue? Hold on. <laughs> let me let me Google this real quick so I can get a temperament test. What is that called? Oh, 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 Volhard. Volhard tends to be the most popular temperament test. There's you, you can look it up online, you can print off a PDF, and you can do it yourself. But you can't do that with the carrot test, right? Which, which is one of the reasons why it's so valuable, in my opinion. The other thing that makes it so valuable is that, you know, obviously you need to have the skill set, you need to take time to study. Um, you also have mentors. I am lucky enough to have a mentor just, just south of me. You know, the only, <laughs> currently the only uh, carrot assessor in the state of Pennsylvania. And you know we're we're ready to do a bunch of carrot tests this coming next next week um, because I'm in that process of pursuing the certification myself. So um, you know it also has if you want to keep going I could talk about this all day if you want to stay stay <laughs> but one more thing before before I end this the thing the big difference between say the Volhard test and the carrot test, right? One's a temperament test, one isn't. Is that the Volhard does have at least two big areas that it misses when it's testing for a service dog, right? One of which is patience, right? Because if you have a dog that needs to um, be very patience and persistence, right? So be very persistent at a task that they're doing, right? Maybe you're just trying to come out of something and, you know, one tap or one boot by a dog's nose to alert you. Hold on. Uh, the persistence for a service dog test. Um, so one boop isn't going to, you know, maybe help alert you to something. You need a dog that can really stay persistent at a task for a while in order to maybe snap you out of something, right? So maybe you're disassociating, maybe you have, you know, CPTSD, maybe you have bipolar, maybe something else is going on. And you really need that constant alert so that um, your dog's helpful. You can't have a dog that's impatient doing these tasks for you because that, number one, it's gonna be hard to train and frustrating. and you already have a life that you need help with. You don't need additional problems <laughs> of trying to train a very difficult dog on top of that, right? Um, so, and then the second trait, what was the second trait? I believe social, social ability, both towards dogs and people, um, is also very important, right? Because you can have a dog that's very activated by seeing people and while yes, you can use prevention and you can train and you can teach an alternative behavior, again, that dog is going to be a lot more difficult to train to stay focused on you in public than say a dog that's very neutral, not afraid of people, not activated by people, but just like, oh yeah, you're there. That's cool. I'm with my person, right? So those are things that other temperament tests lack and they also lack very specific training and they also lack actual data and per percentages of success of how long those dogs stay in their jobs which according to the carrot website they actually have percentages of success because suzanne has worked and currently is still working with some guide dog organizations and she has tracked percentages of puppies based on genetics and their personalities and how long and how successful they have been in those jobs just based on personality and 
her care assessment tool as well. So I hope you guys found that really helpful. I find that no one's really heard of the care test yet. I personally believe it's up and coming and it's a fantastic tool that people need to be utilizing more of. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the carrot test or if there's an assessor in your area, area, feel free to email me or reach out to me over social media. I'm everywhere. I'm on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram. Those are my big three that I want. Okay. Well, I hope that guys, I hope that helps for you guys and I will see you around next time. Bye.